sci-fi and fantasy short stories. His Body Beneath by James Mansell Bang! 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 His head jerked backwards at the abrupt noise from the door. For a moment, looking sluggishly around the room, bleary-eyed and confused, he had no idea where he was. Slowly, his memory returned alongside a throbbing headache. He was where he had spent this same evening every year for the last ten years. The penthouse suite at the Golden Downtown. He had successfully hidden himself away every time this dreadful evening had come along, fake name and all. He didn't consider it a ritual or a tradition. It was a necessity since the very first night. And after tonight, it would all be over. Most would think him mad for wanting it to end, but he did. Bang! 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 The knocking was louder this time and slower. He stayed sat, looking at the door. He let his mind drift upwards, leaving the moment he was in, leaving behind a shell, motionless, looking down on his body and his life. He'd never meditated, but imagined it was something like this. Maybe. He heard a muffled sound coming from behind the thick hotel door. The voice was soft and quiet. Excuse me, Mr. Eels? Room service? I have everything you asked for. A high-pitched voice sounded shaky. <sighs> a fan. Another nervous fan. Shit. So much for being hidden... The boy behind the door looked about 15, but was probably older. He introduced himself as Patrick, a huge fan. His round face was noticeably sweating, even on the small screen attached to the head of the command bot. His eyes were sharp and focused. The display froze for a moment as the boy began to speak again, momentarily capturing his face in a bizarre, contorted shape. I'm slightly nervous to meet you. Of course you are. Everyone is. If this is what you really call meeting, that's how everyone likes it. Stay sat in the safety and comfort of your home and control a soulless bot brandishing a display screen of your face. Nice and safe. The bot was gripping a tray in its cold, metallic hands. A bottle of 40-year-old Talisker 2002 whiskey sat next to a small jug of water and a glass. Not a tradition, a necessity. Shall I put them on the table for you, Mr. Eels? Jackson looked at the tray. No pipette. They always forget the pipette. Don't call me Mr. Eels. Call me Jackson. Yes, thank you. The boy nodded and smiled. The command bot moved slowly into the room. A noticeable delay as Patrick waited patiently. The face on the display stared at Jackson as it entered. Every second he had company was a second too long, even if it was just a fan. The bot sat the tray on the oak table in the middle of the large room. Patrick instructed the bot to touch each item, straightening them all unnecessarily. Wasting time. Extending his stay in the room. The television set was on but muted. It was five minutes to the hour. Do you watch it? Jackson didn't answer. He turned to the table and reached for the bottle. The boy's face watched Jackson on the screen, enraptured. The bot slowly turned to face Jackson. I I'm sure you hear this sort of thing a lot, but I am the biggest fan of the world beneath. The biggest. It... It actually quite literally changed my life. I know you were the first, but the immersions are the absolute best. Nothing can rival what you created. He finished quickly and let out a small giggle to himself. Jackson couldn't help but smile. The kid had passion for the work he'd done. That was nice. It seemed sincere. He wondered what the kid would think after tonight. 
17 years ago, almost to the day, Jackson Eels was working in a sandwich shop downtown called the Yellow Submarine, making sandwiches all day for bus drivers and college students. He hated it. All he'd ever wanted to do was escape. He would often imagine himself somewhere else, leaving his body and visiting a different world through someone else's. Anyone else's. He liked his mind, but didn't care for the shell it inhabited. That could go. Why did he have to be limited to the constraints of his physical body? Every 15-minute break would be spent scribbling thoughts and ideas on deli wrapping paper. Pages and pages were filled with his daydreams. His breaks were occasionally shared with someone else, getting everyone braked out, as his manager would say, ready for the midnight rush. They'd come and sit next to him with their sandwich and ask him what he was writing. It wasn't for their eyes. It was his thoughts, and they were private. It wasn't long before he began channeling it all into a single story. It was huge and vast and everything to him. Slowly, very slowly, it grew and grew until he had a pile of deli paper that resembled a manuscript. This world he had built would occupy his thoughts at all times. Even when he was having a conversation, his mind would drift and slip into the story. He called it the world beneath. He never had aspirations beyond keeping himself to himself. And after the world beneath appeared in his mind, all he wanted to do was somehow inhabit that universe. After it was published, everything changed. He had no idea what he was doing or how it happened. He published a chapter of the story in an online magazine and had been paid a small amount for it. Everything was great. The thought of exposing his ideas and thoughts to the world terrified him. But he'd never had the prospect of more money than the yellow submarine could pay him before. And he liked the sound of it. The first book of The World Beneath was published and became an instant global success. He had written a sprawling story set 100 years in the future, all centered around a murdered girl, a detective, and a tech company creating a new deep-dive experience called Immersion. It was what he had dreamed of, a way to enter a new world with all senses feeling truly present but without leaving the body you had. The immersion was more advanced, more magical, and more brilliant than anything that existed in real world at the time. More lifelike than all the MR fads coming out, and more powerful than the transcendent software that the tech startup Mystic Sound produced straight after book one. Transcendence had tried to replicate and capitalize on the technology from the story, and produced a real-world equivalent. It paled in comparison and was a failure. Jackson continued to write books, completing a book every two years. The series was hailed as one of the greatest works of science fiction since Tomlin Hawksmith wrote The Glimmering Objects Trilogy. Jackson was rich, rich beyond anything he'd ever imagined working at the Yellow Submarine. The story, now spanning time, space, and different worlds, still hinged on a murdered girl and a detective. The mystery of who committed the murder was still to be revealed. Jackson, while dismissing fan theories, tried to ignore the pulp culture phenomenon he had created and continue writing. But one day, he stopped. A man appeared at his apartment one morning. He was from the experimental reality tech giant Sensian Corp. He had a proposition. His pitch lasted over three hours. Jackson sat silently, carefully listening to him. Everyone here at Sensian Corp understands that this story is everything to you. It is your world. We want to make it a reality. 
bring it fully to life. The technology required to produce a lifelike version of immersion is being realized right now inside our labs. We want to bring it to market and let the world have the experience that you could only dream of. Jackson stared at the man. He'd forgotten his name. He'd forgotten a lot while listening to him. Immersion wasn't just some gimmick he thought of while staring out the window while writing. His characters did it because he couldn't, and he lived through his characters. He let the man continue explaining his proposition, slowly edging closer and closer towards him as he explained their idea. A short three years later, Immersion went to market and began seeping into the fabric of everyday life. Jackson became consumed by it. He was granted final approval of all work carried out and every product that was released, and following a major overhaul of senior staff, found himself on the board of Sensian Corp and in full control of the Immersion Project. He had full control of everything and was now a multi-billionaire. Every morning, Jackson would sit at the same table at his local coffee house in the upper north quadrant of the city, Bon Soiree, order the same black coffee with a side of cream from the same waiter and watch what happened around him. He had done this from when he had first begun writing the books and found it a way to totally relax. Things were different now. Aside from occasionally being recognized, which he hated more than anything, he would often see them, sunglasses covering their crimson onyx eyes, an unlimited number of people all paying a hefty subscription fee, living through their eyes, watching their every move, living with them. This was immersion. The technology was simple enough, as explained to him. A person would have a chip installed inside their brain, which, through emitting a powerful signal, would allow access to the person's sight. Only their sight. Jackson knew there was room for expansion. At first, only a few people became hosts. Jackson knew there was a better name for them, but this is exactly what they were. Then... After time and after the safety of the procedure became more publicly known, more and more opted to be hosts. It was the perfect way to let the entire world marvel at just how perfect your life was, by letting them see it firsthand. Becoming a host could reap huge rewards depending on how many viewers you had and how many subscribers. You would be paid on the number of views plus hours broadcasting. The more viewers and more hours spent broadcasting, the more the hosts made, and some hosts made millions. Spotting a host wasn't rare or unusual. Teenagers living abroad would broadcast to their parents. Partners would broadcast to their long-distance spouses. And, as there was no limit to how many viewers a single host could have at one time, even hosts would broadcast back to classrooms for training. Immersion was the ultimate way to experience and live through someone else. Everything that Jackson had wanted. It didn't come as a surprise to anyone that the combined phenomenon of both immersion and the world beneath had led to huge amounts of interest by television studios. After meeting with numerous producers... Jackson signed an eight-series deal with JNP, the biggest television network in the world. The show would run side-by-side side with the series of books, bringing the story of the world beneath to a whole new audience. Jackson, while excited at the prospect, knew he was losing interest in the fictional world of immersion. He had the real-world version. The show was an unrivaled success. It captured audiences from around the world like nothing else. It surpassed the books in popularity as the story raced to its conclusion. Jackson's involvement in the show, 
first as a writer and executive, then a consultant, and finally a cursory paragraph sent with an overview of each episode, diminished more and more each season as his time was spent working with Sensian Corp. A young girl had been murdered in episode one of season one, and a detective had been trying to find the truth for nearly 25 years. In the story, immersion was used by the police, the mob, anyone who had money and power. It was the ultimate tool to peering behind the curtain, gaining access where access wasn't granted. Its final question, unanswered, desperate, begging, was calling. The world was ready to discover the truth. I'll leave you be. It's been amazing to actually meet you, Mr. Eels. The bot began to reverse slowly. Jackson watched the kid look down at something. His watch, maybe. Jackson knew people like Patrick. He would live day in, day out, inside the body of others. His job required him to operate a command bot, so he wouldn't have to really meet anyone. He'd never have to leave his apartment. Command bots were old, very basic and cheap, but reliable, which is why they were used here. The next evolution of immersion was to make the likes of command bots obsolete. A host that could be controlled by the viewer, or the controllers as he'd call them. Not only could a person inhabit a different body, but instead of being merely a passenger inside, you would become them. Take over and be them. The command bot may have done it first, but it wasn't a human body. It was this clunky heap of dead metal. As soon as tonight was over and this side project was complete, he could go back to Sensian Corp and concentrate on the next chapter of immersion. The bot sped backwards quickly. It was one minute to the hour. Clumsily hitting the doorframe, the bot turned on the spot and disappeared out of the door and down the hallway. The door was slowly closing when a hand appeared and caught it. A woman stood in the doorway, her eyes sharp and alert. Rebecca looked at Jackson and then down the hallway to the disappearing command bot. I told them you weren't to be disturbed. I'm sorry. Jackson smiled at Rebecca. She'd never know how little he cared tonight. Rebecca had been Jackson's PA, confidant, and a close friend for the entire run of the show. While in this body, there was no one else he'd rather spend the evening with. She came in carrying paperwork and a laptop. She quickly closed the door. This is it, Jackson. I'm so frickin' nervous. Are you nervous? Rebecca was hurriedly opening her laptop. As well as being Jackson's PA, she would, as she always did, and was paid to do, so Jackson imagined, monitor real-time reactions to the episode. This would be used to create qualitative research methodologies, which would inform the direction of the show the writers would take it forward in. Jackson hated this way of working. Why would I be nervous? He sat down in the armchair and slowly sipped his whiskey. He opened a laptop and placed four small white pads to his forehead and connected them to a processor which was wired into the laptop. He opened a program called Deep Dive. Beneath it read, Immerse Yourself, and showed a silhouetted image of a body floating. It's the end, Jackson. This is how the world beneath will be remembered. I hope you know what you're doing. She quickly darted to the mini bar and returned with a small bottle of vodka and cracked the seal. I just want to move on and finally scrub this dirt off me forever. It's staining my skin. The fan in his laptop began to spin loudly. The program was loading. Rebecca looked at him. The final season's finale was a closely guarded secret. No one had seen it other than those who needed to, which didn't include her. She knew there was no chance of satisfying everybody, but she hoped he hadn't done something stupid. 
This show was people's lives. The ending would define the entire series and how he would be remembered. The alarm went off on her phone. The finale had started. Jackson placed his palms upward and gently closed his eyes. His immersion had started. First, his fingers began tingling. Then his legs started to ache and throb. This always happened when coming out of an immersion. No one could explain why. As his vision slowly returned and the feeling in his entire body came back to him, he opened his eyes. The room was empty. Rebecca's laptop was still open where it was before he dived, but she was gone. Something didn't seem right. He glanced at the time displayed on the wall. Three hours had passed. Keeping track of time during an immersion was difficult. Hours would pass without ever noticing. He hadn't intended to be inside for that long, just until the episode had ended. He reached forward and peered inside the glass in front of him. Empty. Most of the bottle had gone. Rebecca had needed some Dutch courage. He stood up and looked around the room. Nothing seemed out of place. Nighttime now loomed outside, glaring in from the cold. Jackson walked slowly towards the window and looked up at the orange-tinged night sky. It was a strange dark, oily and black with something more than night. He looked down into the sprawling city below. The crack came quickly and suddenly, thrusting him back sharply. A gloopy, white liquid ran down the smashed glass, dripping from the point of impact. Jackson stood still, staring at the strange shape of broken glass and liquid now on the penthouse window. Gently, he placed his fingers over it. Another smash, this time to the right of the window, close enough to hear. He pressed his cheek against the window, trying to peer down the street. An object flew upwards, missing the window completely and flying over the building. Another, and another, and another. The small glass bottles began flying towards his window with increasing rapidity. Get back from the window! Rebecca rushed in and slammed the door, flinging a chair up against the handle. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to actually work. He smiled at Rebecca. Move away, Jackson! Have you seen what they're doing down there? She pulled him away and back into the room. They're fucking rioting! It's total carnage! They're using command bots to attack the window and trying to break into the hotel with cars on fire. The staff have barricaded the door. Jackson didn't move. He stared deeply through the window, imagining what it was like down there. Never had he thought it would be like this. Rebecca moved to the table in the middle of the room and sat in front of her laptop. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. She was frantically rocking back and forth. Jackson placed the glass down next to her and poured the whiskey. He clinked the glass with the bottle and drank. This isn't bad. It's what we wanted. It's a reaction. Have you ever seen a mob riot because they didn't like a fucking TV show before? He sat down and picked up his own laptop, still open on deep dive. Rebecca looked up. You were gone for longer than usual. I was about to pull you out. How is Jacob? Rebecca said with resignation, looking down at her laptop. He's well. Always ready to let me escape when I need him. Did he know this was coming? Jackson didn't answer. He took another slug of whiskey, now staring into the black reflection of the television screen. Rebecca turned to the window just in time to see it gracefully dancing through the air, bursting into flame as it erupted against the glass. The chain holding the burning bottles unraveled quickly and whipped hard against the window, sending a long crack from corner to corner. A gaping hole appeared in the edge of the window as the wind rushed into the room. The paperwork on the table flew into the air as the white gloop covering the outside of the building began seeping inside the room, burning hard and fast. Holy fuck! 
Rebecca turned to Jackson. What have you done? His reflection stared at him, judging him. He answered her. I've ended my story. They hate it. Every single one of them. The socials are in a mad frenzy. She sat back down and began searching for something on the laptop. Jackson watched her. It doesn't matter what they think. It never mattered what they think. None of this matters. Come on, Jackson. That's bullshit, and you know it is. She spun the laptop to face Jackson. Look at what they're saying. They wanted answers, and you gave them nothing. Absolutely nothing. He turned his head to see a screen of comments. He didn't need to read them. He knew what they'd say. Do you know what it's like to wait this long for answers and then not... Jackson stood and faced her. Yes, I know what it's like to wait for fucking answers and not get any. I want answers just like the rest of them, but there's no one to give them to me. The chair that was pressed against the door handle cracked and fell apart as the door opened. A short man stood in the doorway with his mouth gaping open, staring at the burning window. Jesus Christ! The baseball bat in his hands was shaking badly. <sighs> They've broken through the main doors. The hotel staff have been evacuated. We dismantled the elevator, but they're coming up the stairwell. They don't know what room you're in, so keep the door closed. The man was in shock. He stared at them both, sweating profusely and panting like a dog. <sighs> we did everything we could... But they found out you were here. He turned to look at Rebecca, hoping for a response. There was none. Did you watch it? The man looked back at Jackson awkwardly and quickly away, down at the floor, anywhere but into his eyes. You need to leave. There's an exit on the opposite side of the building which is clear. He left without looking up. Rebecca closed her laptop and made an attempt to gather the few papers still on the table. She walked towards the door. I, I don't understand. Everything you've worked towards and built, you've destroyed it all. This is over. How could J&P even allow this? Her voice wavered. It was tired and exasperated. I convinced them. Rebecca laughed an exhausted laugh. She shrugged, and her hands loudly slapped against her sides. Fine. Congratulations on sabotaging your life's work. My life's work. It is mine to sabotage. As if I was still writing this on deli paper. I thought at least you would understand that. The curtains either side of the window rapidly ignited as flames raced up into the ceiling. Heat flew across the room towards Rebecca and Jackson. Hell was encroaching. No, I don't understand it. At all. This isn't just your work, Jackson. It's mine and the hundreds of people who helped you. This was for the fans, not for you. You had a service to them. She was raging, her hands shaking. Over the sounds of the flames and her voice, a door closed loudly in the corridor. Rebecca turned and took a step towards the doorway. She put her head into the corridor. No! Jackson cried as the shotgun blast shook the foundations of the room. The hanging lights swung into each other as Rebecca's lifeless body collapsed quickly in the doorway, her eyes staring up at Jackson. She was dead. Jackson looked down. His hands had shut out in front of him as if ready to protect himself. He stood completely frozen, staring down at Rebecca's body. The curtain rail behind him cracked and clattered to the ground, smashing a glass table beneath it as flames jumped to the carpet, slowly creeping their way towards him like the end of time. He turned away from the body on the ground and stared at the carnage. Black, crimson onyx eyes lay in a contorted face in a smashed window in front of him, burning a hole into his back. 
The host was gripping the gun tightly, aimed at Jackson, his hands shaking on the stock and forehand. Jackson looked carefully at the man. He recognized the face. Patrick. What the fuck did you just do? Jackson cried. His head was ready to burst. Patrick didn't respond. He stared at Jackson and took a step closer, gesturing to the table with the shotgun. Jackson sat down without protest. As Patrick moved closer, Jackson caught Rebecca's eyes over his shoulder through the doorway. Look at me! Patrick's voice was high and shrill. Jackson could smell the sweat. How many viewers do you have hiding in there? The people who matter. The people who the world beneath matters to the most. We have questions we want answering. You have the answers, Mr. Eels. Patrick's face was like a stone, devoid of all emotion. His voice was slow and measured. He, and only he, had known exactly where Jackson Eels was. He would rise to the occasion and be the savior to the people. Jackson wondered if this was Patrick's first time as a host. I told you not to call me Mr. Eels. Call me Jackson. I gave you all the answers I have. Why do you think I have the answers you want? Who else has them? Patrick spat the words out of his mouth. Jackson looked down the dark barrel of the gun pointed directly at his chest. Time slowed down as he stared into the inky blackness. Jackson thought his life should be flashing by. He was glad it wasn't. He hung his head and rubbed his forehead hard, gritting his teeth. Why do you think there are answers? Why are you so certain I gave you questions in the first place? Why does everyone think I owe them something? Patrick squinted, staring at Jackson. He looked at him for a moment, a look of surprise and anger. You gave us everything. Do you know how much your work means to us? It changed everything for us. It gave us something to live for. Yes, we all knew the show and the books would come to an end, but we could continue to deep dive just like Detective Ellick can solve our own mysteries. We would carry on the world beneath through our own immersions and keep the story alive forever. You gave us all of this. Patrick was slowly moving closer. The heat coming from behind Jackson was unbearable. The fire was licking up the walls now and onto the ceiling. Sirens drifted up from the streets below and into the inferno. The world beneath did not end tonight. That is not the ending. Why did you do that? Ellick's journey is not over. It's his destiny, his life's mission to find the truth. Why would you end it like that? <sighs> we all know how distracted you've been with making your millions with those corporate cocksuckers at Sensian Corp. We do not accept your ending. I'm sorry. That's the way it ended. It's my story. It's my world. The story is over, and that is the way it ended. None of this is for you or any of you motherfuckers in there. Jackson pointed at Patrick's head. This is my story, and it has ended. But it isn't yours. You are merely a conduit. We own the story. It is for us. We own it. We own it. We own it. He continued to speak, muttering to himself while walking closer and closer to Jackson. The words became quieter. We own it. We own it. We own it. The shotgun flew from Patrick's hands as Jackson lunged forward and knocked it across the room. He grabbed Patrick's neck and rammed him hard against the wall. Their faces were within an inch of each other. The blackened eyes stared into Jackson, swimming with unnatural patterns. He had never seen them this close before. What do you stupid motherfuckers think I've been doing for the last 15 years? This world has been my lifeline, not yours, not anyone else's. 
mine. I have given permission to those who wanted to join me to do so, but this is a strictly no-talking ride. Watch, follow, enjoy, immerse yourself. Do whatever the fuck you want, but do not question the story. I am not a conduit. The story is in my brain, and my brain belongs to me. Now, put down the gun and go make peace with the fact that the world beneath is finally over. I have, and I am so fucking happy about it. Jackson pushed Patrick away and turned to look at the fire. He wasn't making it out of here. The smoke was thick and dense. His eyes were stinging badly. A series of loud crashes boomed from overhead, shaking the room. The hotel was burning to the ground, absolving itself of the sins it held captive in its rooms, cleansed by fire. As he turned, his knees exploded. His legs shot out from under him as his head hit the ground hard. His body began shaking as pain seared through his senses. The shotgun blast had completely destroyed his knee and most of his leg. The room began spinning as he tried to focus and hold on to consciousness, slipping away every second. He lay his head back on the floor, breathing harder and faster than he'd ever breathed before. What had happened? He knew there would be a reaction, and he knew he wouldn't care. But this... Patrick loomed over him and began strapping something onto his head. Jackson couldn't concentrate. Everything hurt. He wanted to vomit. He felt the familiar feeling of four small white pads being gently placed on his forehead and the comforting sound of deep dive loading up. Patrick sat at the table with the shotgun casually on his lap. The fan of the laptop began to spin loudly as the pads began to heat up. Patrick stood and moved over Jackson's shivering body. All we wanted was the right ending. Whatever that was we just watched, it is not the conclusion we wanted. It wasn't right. We need to know the truth. We all deserve that. He began moving Jackson to a slumped sitting position against the leg of the table. The world needs someone to blame for that poor young girl's murder. It needs a villain. An ending. It isn't real, Jackson shouted, spit flying out of his mouth. Yes, it is. I'll change the ending in the books. The books aren't finished. Patrick smiled and laughed. He picked up the laptop and quickly began typing. He stopped and stood up, ready to address his viewers. My friends, my brothers and sisters, thank you for letting me be your host this evening. There are 1.8 million of you. I am here to right a wrong. The ending is still to come. In the biggest twist of all, our once lord is now our Judas Iscariot. He will give us the end we need. He is our villain. Patrick looked down on Jackson and smiled a sincere expression. He gently squeezed Jackson's shoulder. You can save everything. It's the least you can do, Mr. Eels. Jackson's vision blacked out for a moment before returning sharp and focused. He was looking down on himself, bleeding and dying. Patrick's hand was still on his shoulder, his body's shoulder. He began to stand, and Jackson heard his loud voice narrating to his viewers. He'd never imagined a deep dive in the same room as the host. Why had he never imagined that? Too late now. He looked down as Patrick's hands pointed the shotgun at his own lifeless body lying hunched on the floor beneath him. His own body. Strange, Jackson thought, looking down on yourself just before the end, watching through a stranger's eyes, occupying their body as they take the life from yours. The pain was still there, but numb. It hurt just to look at himself in this way. But it was just a body, a shell. He wasn't in there anymore. 
His eyes were closed, and his head was slumped over, consciousness slowly dissipating. The immersion was still strong, but he knew it would soon end. He tried to imagine his eyes closing. He let his mind drift upwards, leaving the moment he was in, leaving behind the shell slumped against the table, motionless, looking down on his body beneath and the life he was leaving. The immersion began to blur and falter as his body slipped from its waking state. He heard Patrick's voice, quiet and distant, shouting something. He guessed it was something profound and meaningful. He was glad he couldn't hear it. He felt the presence of all the millions of people he had let down, but he had no responsibility to them. It was his story and his world. He had allowed them along for the ride. It was still his notes on greasy sandwich deli paper. Maybe that's all it should have ever been. A soft thud shook the room as the immersion cut out. Everything went black, but his story had already ended. James is a British writer and filmmaker. He creates within the sci-fi and horror genre. He has written and directed multiple short films, which have screened around the world and are available to watch on platforms such as Dust and Crypt TV. He is currently concentrating on writing short stories and screenplays. From a very young age, James has been fascinated about the weird and the wonderful, the dark and the dreadful. First discovering The Evil Dead and Stephen King, James continues to explore themes such as the horrors of mental health, technology, and the paranormal. He resides amongst the hills of Hertfordshire in the UK. His website is james-mansell.com. I love the argument that James brought to this story. Who owns the story? Is it the creator or is it the people who are viewing it? Obviously, from a legal standpoint, it's the creator, and even from a logical standpoint. But there could be an argument made for the fact that you have basically promised an experience to the viewer or the reader. And if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, they've wasted all this time on something that you promised them. It's an argument I've had myself on occasion with a co-worker. Uh, we were talking about Patrick Rothfuss and his books that we're not actually sure if he's ever going to publish the third one. I think he will, but we'll see. <laughs> Either way, I thought the story was excellent. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a thumbs up and a comment if you're on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast, just be sure to subscribe for more brand new short stories. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.